Hello everyone, and we are so excited to have you join us again at the interchange brought to you by Maximize. My name is Rahel, and this is Matthew Heineke, who we are your host today. And we'll be sharing some exciting things again with you, coming from a very interesting guest. Matt, who's our guest today? So today our guest is Jesse Kripschenk. Uh, we're going to be talking about bias in generations. And Jesse is the Director of Leadership Development at the Foursquare International Church. She enjoys walking others through hard places and bringing life and joy to others. She helps organizations catalyze their development by using bravery and courage to invoke change. And she's been involved in four startups, all of which are still thriving today. She has helped an engineering firm turn around in three years. And she's had the privilege of being a leader of leaders, and coaching their development for over 10 years. So welcome, Jesse. Yeah, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. Well, as we always start this interchange session, I always ask something that brings ice. So the question is, what can you tell us about yourself that is quirky or interesting? <laughs> well, there's a lot about me that's quirky. Whether or not anyone finds it interesting <laughs> is the second conversation. <laughs> Um, but I, I was a professional rock climber at the age of 15, and I was an expedition leader. Um, so I trained leaders for about a decade, and then I've been training leaders of leaders for another decade. But I played roller derby. I'm, I, um, I like the physical, aggressive sports. Um, it helps me be calmer in my normal life, I think. Um, but those are, those are some interesting things about me. So, wow. yeah. That's amazing. Rock climbing. I've never done rock climbing, but I don't think I'll be any good. First of all, I'll just I'll, it's just scary. It's scary for me. <laughs> well, that's where bravery becomes important, right? Yes. And it has to be, bravery is not something someone else can give you. They can encourage you in it, uh -huh. but it is something that you have to find in your own self. That's true. <laughs> mm -hmm. no, and uh, yeah, I've done a little bit of rock climbing. I grew up, grew up in Utah myself. So, and uh, yeah, it's a, it's a tough sport for sure. And you got to be in good shape. And as far as the, the aggressive sports, I, I love playing football and rugby growing up. So I had that some, some of that kind of aggression to, to get out. Um, yeah, I tried to go out for my middle school football team because I was part of the crew mm -hmm. that the that that would be called to go play in the park. But then um, they didn't have girls on the football team. So ah. I wasn't <laughs> able to continue in the sport that I love and still ah. love to this day. So I'm a huge football fan. Oh, oh cool, wow. man. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's too bad. I mean, I, and you see now there are some women in professional uh, in the NFL, which is really cool. So that's probably maybe a good segue into talking about bias. Uh, you know, what what part do you think bias has played in terms of you growing up versus where it is today in, in that sense? Yeah. You know, one of the things that I find the most interesting is the bias of what a leader is. I mean, even, even now I'm getting ready to teach a, and do a training later this week. And so I went onto Google and I just Googled under images, I Googled leadership and the images that come up are male, they're all blue. Um, and they, they're all this archetype of what a leader is. And, and there's so much bias in that when my perspective and what I've always tried to do is help you find the leader version of you. And so removing the bias of, you know, whether it's about power, control, answers, um, posture, like, like if we remove all of that and I just help you find the leader version of you, then you can succeed and, and, and aspire to whatever you, whatever it is that you want to do. So bias, especially in leadership is huge. The tests are biased. They're all Jungian based in this archetype of dominance and power and um, so I've experienced a lot of <laughs> a lot of bias in an interesting way. Um, I'm in the religion sector and there's that's not a, a large place for for women to thrive, although I belong to um, a faith community where women are empowered and, and do thrive. Um, but just this this idea that somehow emotions are female and they're not valuable, you know, except for as data points for leadership, like as a neuroscientist, as an Ivy League trained neuroscientist, you know, I know that that's a bias. Um, so 
it's just really interesting all the things that we just accept as being true about ourselves and others that um, end up not end up causing frustration, end up causing angst, and end up uh, their hindrances to us being successful. Not because we're inherently not designed to be successful, but because we've agreed with everyone else's narrative. And so finding the truth of your own story and the leader version of you. And then what does that look like when that thrives? So, so bias is, yeah, it's <laughs> huge. And I've only succeeded because I've, I've swam against the stream, so to speak. Yeah. It's interesting. You said uh, in, in initially, when you started talking about, you said you Googled leadership and those images come up because on it, not the, there's also bias in the system, like in Google pictures, you know, that data is already biased. So even when you're searching, you're getting more biased things. So uh, yeah, that, that's interesting you mentioned that. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it reminds me of what your uh, sister's doing. Uh, I forget the name of it, Coded. Uh, yeah, Coded Bias, Coded, coded Bias. Coded Bias, yeah. There's a, she, the, she works for, it's called the Algorithmic Justice League. Mm. And uh, so they look at all these different algorithms and how biased they are. So if you go for a job application or if you're profiled by the, the police, uh, they weed out, you know, if like for the job applications, they'll, they'll kind of weed you out if you're, you have an African sounding name. When, and the same for the, the police, they'll, they'll wrongly kind of, uh, you know, interrogate somebody because they, they have dark skin. So, and the interesting thing about bias is that it's something we learn at a small age. It mm -hmm. doesn't carry all the um, social implications that we think it does. It really comes about because our brain is trying to find shortcuts in order to process mm -hmm. all of the information in the environment around us. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it starts out as a mechanism to just help us function in a complex social world. But as, as we see what has happened in society and society reinforces those and then adds value judgment to those, because there is you, inherently there isn't value judgment at the beginning, but that's something that society adds to bias. And, and then we're in the system of it and we don't know that we're in the system. And it's a huge emotional developmental stage to break out of that system, to question it. And such a journey for everyone to go on whatever bias they've been taught, whatever narratives they've agreed with to find themselves in a different story is um, it's just a big deal for, for the human journey. So bias isn't necessarily harmful. It can be innocent, but it's the society and the way that all of that value um, judgment has been added into it that, that creates something that's so harmful. Yeah, yeah. I read in, a, in an article once that uh, uh, there was this research done and that babies are actually not born with any bias, but the bias of, for example, the facial bias, they develop that in their first year of life. And then from there, like you say, you know, they just build upon it and consciously or unconsciously, they use it, uh, you know, with what they say and what they do. And that's how it kind of strengthens itself. But like you said, it's, it's not bad for you. Your mind is trying to do something useful, but at the same time, it's recognizing them that seems to be hard. You know, as you, as you grow older, like you say, trying to swim out of that. First, recognizing it, you know, what, that's already hard to begin with sometimes. You really have to dig deep. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, kind of going back to your uh, talking about bias in religion, I know a lot of churches still maybe struggle with allowing women to move up in the ranks of churches. And one kind of weird thought that came in my head, you know, you're talking about when you Google leadership. And I was thinking on, in a religious sense, you know, if you look at leaders like Jesus or Buddha, if you Google those pictures, they would be totally different. Than, you know, the way they, they dressed and they would, you, if you saw them today, you would think they are not leaders. So I just think that's kind of a weird, weird way of, of thinking about yeah. it. And then that's, that's definitely the thing that I'm passionate about is taking the power dynamic out of leadership. Mm -hmm. um, and because I think that's what can end up corrupting anything. And, and I totally agree with you. If we, we met Jesus or we met Buddha today, we would, we would think that they were really nice and maybe we want to, you know, hang out, but at the same time, we wouldn't look at them and go, Oh yeah, you can lead a global movement over generations. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Something there's something that we misunderstand about the power of kindness and the power of joy 
over the long term because we're just looking for um, you know that short term return and that short term impact. Mm-hmm. And it, I think it undermines our long term effectiveness. True. Yeah, yeah, very very well spoken. Yeah. Um, so, in terms of you know switching maybe a little bit to generations, uh, and I know bias is like such a huge. You know, if you say bias, well, what kind of bias? There's you know hundreds of them, but but in terms of what you've seen uh, in your your life, and you know, what are your thoughts on bias within generations? Yeah, generations seem to have um, like defining values, and those are they have uh, their own definition of leadership, their own definition of failure, um, how they seek truth is different in each generation. Um, what their ultimate goal is. And so I think that's, I think that's okay that the generations are different. It's just when any one generation thinks that theirs is the only way and we, and we stop learning how to relate to another. So, you know, when you complain about a different generation and their value, um, because it's not our value, then the bias can be in there. Um, I think it's really interesting the way that each upcoming generation uh, comes against the assumptions of that value and reveal the bias. I don't think like, I don't think the baby boomers would know their bias without the Gen Xers. And I don't think the Gen Xers would know their bias without the millennials. And so I, you know, one of the interesting questions then organizationally is, you know, how are we designing the organization? What are we defining success? How are we taking care of people in our human resources and our benefits packages? You know, I was just with my uncle who is 73 and he was uh, talking about um, and, and struggling with the idea that a person could work from home and that not be seen as a benefit. So should they get paid the same as someone who's going into the office and has to get dressed and has to commute and all those things that are not tax deductible, right? It's not, it's just seen as the thing that you give to be at your job. Um, So he was struggling as a boomer with the idea that working from home wasn't a benefit and they didn't have to give as much to their job. Um, Well, I'm, I'm not a millennial, but I can see in my, in myself, you know, Um, my, what I see is my give and take the thing that I bring to my company, the thing I bring to my organization, I might define that a little differently than my baby boomer uncle. And so I think I'm giving a lot because now I'm available later in the day, right? My boundaries of my time have been eroded. And so what we see there as being, um, the, the bias of what we've put value in changes, and is different in the different generations. So when we set up a work environment based around those and we reward based on those biases, I think that's where we may end up. um, Our our business may have a sunset because we can't connect to the new generations. Mm. Mm. Wow, I never thought about it like that. Wow. Yeah, Yeah, and I think, um, you know, I'd read a a study about... uh, the, the benefit of having friends that are older and younger than you. And it looks, you know, from the, the study, they said that you, you basically you're happier. The more, the more diverse your relationships are in terms of age, uh, the, the happier that you are. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I think you're able to see yourself better. And I think personal contentment with your own voice increases personal happiness. So it's not about respect or being successful with other people. Uh, I mean, for some people it may be, but I really think that underneath that is contentment that you're okay, that who you are is okay. And um, as you settle in there, then, then you seem to be happier because you know what you have to offer everyone else around you um, and how you fit in that. So belonging is pretty important to the human psyche. So as we, (laughs) and diversity helps us feel more special. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. It's hard to be lost in the crowd. If I'm the only redheaded female in the room, right? I know I'm not lost. (laughs) And so I don't, I mean, as long as I have peace with who I am, which is a, which is a big deal to have, but um, yeah, diversity. um, I, in my experience has also brought both wisdom and happiness. Wow. No, I like that. I like, uh, uh, the two things you said, you know, being being okay with who you are, being yourself. I think that you're right. That's super, super important. And I never looked at it like that as you, you know, you're saying being the only redhead in the room, I'm special. And so I think that's cool. It's a, it's a better way of kind of looking at things, you know, 
instead of I'm different or I'm awkward or, you know, yeah, I, I am different. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think also one thing, you know, when we talk about the, the generations, uh, it's good to be aware of, of maybe the differences in generations. Like you said, baby boomers might have a different outlook than you know, Gen Xers. But I also feel that uh, there's some stereotypes that fit into the generations that also can be detrimental in some ways. You might assume that, oh, well, he's a, he's a baby boomer. He, he doesn't want me to text him, you know, and maybe they do like to text. You don't know, right? So you ask them. Right. I mean, the, the pr- I think the hard part about bias and why it causes so much damage is it causes us to assume and, it, and we fail to be curious in the moment, right? Because if I don't know anything about you, then you, then you're, um, you're someone new to me, then I'm going to be more curious and I'm going to ask you questions and I'm not going to assume and just fill in the space there. Right. So bias causes us to be less curious and that's where we miss people. Um, and I, yeah, with the generations, with my uncle, assuming (laughs) what people are thinking about wanting to work from home and their motivation there, um, is the challenge, right? So he's not asking, hey, what does that provide for you? What is the value there? And then um, then walking through that. So the, the, um, the, the stereotypes, while seem to be helpful in the macro, are very uh, hin- are a hindrance in the micro for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you just have to be careful in, in how, how you use them. I mean, it's a, a lot of these things are, are like that. I and mean, we look at cultural differences or gender differences or personality differences, you know, people don't necessarily want to be labeled or put into a box, you know, because I'm this age or I'm this, this gender, this is who I am, but it does help to have some general knowledge about it. I think, you know, because it it gives you a better chance of how to approach that person that you've never approached before. Yeah. I think um, when I think about the generations, I think about it, the stereotypes being a starting place for a conversation, at least. So, you know, hey, what is my basic benefits package based on the value that people have for time off, for family, for education, and then having a a more nuanced conversation from there. So um, I think we want to think about living in a bias-free world, but I don't think that's realistic. Your brain would be extremely overwhelmed by that. (laughs) I think it's just that value judgment part. If we can, we can be curious, we can double check our assumptions and remove and remove that value judgment. Um, but I think that it's less harmful. No, I, I love that. And I, I think that curiosity is really the key. I mean, we're, we're curious from the time we're born. We're always curious. And that's, that's probably why we watch the news so much because we're curious, you know, what's going on, what's, what's happening. And I think, what's helped Rahel and I out a lot is just being curious about each other. You know, we, we came from two totally different backgrounds in so many ways. And that's how, that's how our relationship started was just like, you know, what's it, what's it like to be you, you know, and (laughs) what do you do and how do you do it? And so, and that was, it was fun actually. It made it a fun thing to do. It did. And, and, (laughs) and through the asking and the curiosity, you get to sometimes bump into some assumptions you had made and you're like, oh, I, I was wrong about that. Mm-hmm. You know, it's yeah. good to discover those moments and you're like, well, OK, so now that I've discovered this, well, what did I miss? Because I was thinking that the whole time. So, <laughs> I love it. This is the beauty of humanity. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> yes. So uh, if you were to take, you know, bring about one kind of key takeaway or key uh, something that you want the audience to take home with them from this conversation, what would that, what would that look like? Um, For this conversation, I think understanding that we all, we all have those biases, they're implicit. We don't even know. And so when, when we run into them, when we discover them, um, not defending them, right. If we can take a moment and breathe and, um, lean into the awkwardness of being wrong for that moment, Mm -hmm. instead of becoming defensive, instead of, you know, retreating and justifying, if we can say, Oh, wow, I, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. And then ask a question to discover. I think one of the gift, the greatest gifts that we can give one another is the courage to be known and to, to seek to know. So um, yeah, leaning into those moments of curiosity reaching out, trying to understand one another, or at least trying to discover 
one another. Um, and, and then if you have a person who's been harmed by bias, like I have, then understanding that it takes courage to be known and, and be gracious and allow yourself, um, allow people to be wrong about you and graciously help them discover who you are. Then, uh, then we can move beyond any kind of hindrances and uh, we can learn how to work with one another and, and be the best person we are with one another and share that. That's a good one. That's, that's great. And I, uh, I guess I would ask maybe one more question is, you know, taking that first step, like you said, towards either being, trying not to be, you know, defensive and put up the wall or trying to lean into uh, that uncomfortable area. How does someone go about that first step? Because that's really the hardest step to take, I think. So do you have any advice on how to, how to, how to get to that first step? Yeah, I think, I think the science research is that it, is you have about a six second window to either let yourself um, be overcome by whatever the, the survival emotion is or, or survival mechanism is, um, or, or breathe and kind of understand and calm that down and choose to be, choose to believe the best in the other person. Um, and so then seek to understand, right. As, uh, Stephen, uh, would say, so, so take a moment, breathe, and then graciously and kindly invite the other person into that shared reality of who you really are. And, um, that, you know, if you have to forgive them in that moment, if that's what's necessary, or just, you know, choose to believe the best of them, I think most people won't disappoint you, you know, rare is the person um, who would. So it, it's a, it is a self-regulation step. Meditation helps with that as well. Um, I think finding patients around your family is a good way to build that um, as well. So, and if you can do it with your family, I think you can find a way to do it with strangers. True. No, excellent. I, you're right. Breathe. I mean, I've heard that even uh, a lot of us aren't breathing correctly. You're supposed to breathe kind of low from your diaphragm. And, but you're right, you just take one breath, one or two deep breaths, it kind of, it does relax you, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and can bring your mind into a, a different state. Yeah, because it's so easy to, to let your emotions run control of you. Yeah, so we have about six seconds to choose who you want them to meet. Mm, I oh, like that, wow. six seconds to choose who you want them to meet. Oh, can, I, can I use that? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to use it. I'm going to use it for myself. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you so much, Jesse. It was a pleasure having you here. And again, I'm Matthew, and this is Rahel. And you've been listening to The Interchange by Maximize. <laughs>